Hello and welcome to Eat Sleep Code, the official Telerik podcast. I'm your host, Ed Charbonneau, and with me today is my co-host, John Bristow. How are you doing, John? I'm good. It's a little early. I don't know why. I didn't start as uh, effectively as I usually do, but I'm, uh, I got my <laughs> coffee going, so the caffeine will kick in and uh, we'll we'll have some a lot of stuff to talk about this week, actually. So yeah. Lots of really cool, interesting things. A lot of security stuff for some reason. Just seems like it happens that way, right? Yeah. Uh, we'll try to tie these together. I, I did a little loose organization of of some of this stuff to try to get the um, conversation in in order here. So uh, why don't we go ahead and pop a screen share up here and uh, show some of these articles off that we're talking about today. Uh, we got a couple .NET things that I wanted to touch base on, and and you as well. Yeah. So um, first one is uh, .NET performance delivers again for Bing from .NET 5 to .NET 7. So I'm assuming that uh, .NET powers Bing and they've upgraded to .NET 7 and this is a win? It's .NET all the things. So they talk <laughs> a little bit about the history here of what they were utilizing on their side. But yes, so um, there's a lot of stuff, central role of integrations uh, for what they now call the AI powered Bing, basically. So um, yes. their central workflow engine, uh, which they call Zap uh, from .NET 5 um, to, to .NET 5 to the .NET, from the .NET framework, and then now to .NET 7. And this report goes into all the benefits that they saw as being one of the early adopters and then uh, tuning their insights as uh, or tuning their sites, turning their sites rather towards .NET 8. Wow, this caffeine really needs to kick in. I'm not <laughs> <correct>. <laughs> yes, so uh, it's yet another article that you can share with your business stakeholder, whomever who you're talking to about upgrading to .NET latest. Uh, if you need evidence, this is these are the types of articles that matter. So I'm speaking mm -hmm. to the developer audience now. So I know that it's always a constant battle of, well, you know, we've got to, we got to wait. We got to make sure it's stable and all that sort of stuff. And you know, it is. It is, and you should upgrade. And uh, these are the re these are the benefits you'll see. So, so if you haven't touched Bing in a while, um, I would suggest giving giving it a look. I, my friend Sam Basu here, he loves Bing. He's like the biggest Bing advocate I've ever met. Um, he's been on yeah. on Bing for for longer than than anyone would probably like to admit. Um, so he, he's always been on the Bing bandwagon. He's always telling me I gotta I gotta give it a try, and uh, I've I've had a hard time having a reason to go off and, and use Bing. But I I think I finally might have to go back to Sam and say there's some pretty neat stuff happening there. Uh, so it's funny you bring this up. So this all started with Chrome and Windows and my USB mic having fits on stream. And okay. it turns out that using Edge has much better performance characteristics when I'm streaming and no sound issues. So I've, I've switched over to Edge uh, primarily for streaming, which made me go ahead and just try it out for a little bit, set it as a default browser, which I thought I'd never do. And uh, with that comes the obvious uh, Bing by default. But there, there's some really interesting stuff that happens when... Um, you Google or search things. God, that's going to be a hard habit to break. When you search things uh, with uh, Bing, and I didn't get it in the Clint Eastwood thing here. I'm just trying to think of like a generic uh, .NET latest version or something like that. Just search something up. And they've uh -huh. integrated, maybe it's in chat. There it is. Chat GPT is now part of the search experience. Have you seen this? I have. Yeah, so it's pretty interesting. Um, I've tried it out, and um, it's been pretty effective for some stuff. So it's it's a, it's definitely worth taking a look and uh, giving a try. I'm not saying it's going to be the thing that you necessarily will switch to because of it, but it's worth looking at. Like being fair and kind of giving it a test run. Yeah, you know, the thing about these things, Ed, is that when you live outside the continental U.S., uh... Things look different. <laughs> do they really? So they do, <laughs> yes, unfortunately. The sad reality is a lot of companies have a very myopic view of the world. Uh, it is U.S. only. So a lot of these mm -hmm. 
the functionality you see inside of the U.S. are not are not outside the U.S. So I don't think yeah. that it's fully featured outside the U.S. So, so you're saying the geographic rollout has not hit the other side of the planet. I, I'm, yet. I'm just saying that life is different outside the U.S. That's all I thought saying. you lived in the future. It is, it's literally Friday where you live. And well, for yes. some reason, I have things that you don't. So look, I'm not wearing shades. OK, the future is not bright. Um, you know, so no. Uh, we're giving off yeah. some like uh, Max Hedrum vibes, though. So, oh, yes, that's right. I got the floating head going. Sorry. Um, <laughs> yes. So, uh yeah, I mean, that's the thing about, I think the thing that most people I talk to, like, I have a lot of friends in the US and they're like, why don't you just use the the whatever, or I subscribe to the the thing. And I'm like, I don't have yeah. the thing. Like, we don't get the thing. Yeah. Like, YouTube Premium switched on for me a few, like, a years ago. And I remember when that finally came, I was like, yes, thank you. Um, I want to have this. But, you know, there's a lot of things that I would love to have. Like, pr like, like Amazon Prime didn't hit. Australia for a long time, or Canada for that matter. Um, YouTube TV, for example, these are just facilities that you guys just run with, which is awesome. Yeah. Like power to you. Bing Chat, for example, I, I don't know if that's localized to just the US or not. I don't know, but I suspect my, my first instinct, this is the thing. As an American living in continental US, I'm suspected a lot of a lot of folks on the stream are like, yeah, it just turns on and we just use it. I'm like, that's fair. <laughs> for us, this is like the iPhone, website, service, streaming yeah. platform, it's launched. And then it's like that now the clock's running and like everyone that goes like this, the rest of the world are like, all right, how long is it going to take years? How many years is it going to take until we get it? Yeah. Well, one thing that I always find bizarre and like it totally makes sense when you think of how corrupt like media companies are, but <laughs> like, I don't know another term for it, uh, anti-consumer, whatever you want to say. But like, if you tell somebody like, oh, there's this great show and they're like, well, where do I watch it? And you're like, well, it's on streaming service, right. whatever. Yeah, That show may be licensed to its competitor somewhere else. And like, even though it looks like it's like one of the premier, like, um, what do you call it? Like flagship shows for that streaming service on the other side of the world. It's totally like shipping a, a, on like a Netflix or something rather than Hulu or whatever it is. Yep. So like I could see where you're coming from. Like yep. you always forget about that stuff, but yeah. Uh, if you're in the U S uh, give, give Bing a look, <laughs> see what you think of the latest features. Um, and, uh, you know, judge for yourself whether it's a useful tool or not. I think I've found uh, some pretty um, interesting things to do with it. Still find myself back on uh, Google every now and then, but uh, it's still pretty cool. Uh, keeping on with the .NET conversation, John, um, I've been watching .NET, uh, ASP.NET 8 being right. developed. And uh, you can actually do this live and in real time um, just by going to their GitHub page. Like, we used to go to the uh, MVP summit every year, which is coming up again for the first time in a long time. And right. we'd have to sign these NDAs and we'd get to look at like the latest .NET stuff. And then we'd have to keep hush hush on it until like build or something like that. But if you just go to GitHub these days, um, and you go to the ASP.NET Core repo on GitHub, click on issues over to milestones. Look at all these uh, previews that are cataloged here under milestones. What's really cool is you can go into say like .NET preview three, and then you can scan through like all of the work items. And uh, there, there's some like uh, less impressive things in here, uh, like housekeeping items. But every once in a while, you can find, let's see if it's in preview four. I was looking at some of these. It's like, oh, here's some Blazor features that are coming. Oh, nice. That I had no aware of at all. Uh, one of them was like uh, forget the, sections. Forget the MVP summit. Just, just stick to the GitHub repo. Yeah. <laughs> so there, there's something in one of these about sections being built into right. uh, Blazor layouts, which is something that hadn't been... Uh, introduced the blazer before there's a bunch of blazer united stuff in here nice. so i was i was in there kind of peeping at the 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 sausage being made mm -hmm. and uh seeing uh some of the new features being planned uh for for all of the uh blazer stuff and ASP.NET stuff um it looks like they're updating some of the um the authentication and identity uh, templates and stuff. So there's some really neat stuff happening in here. 
So ha have a minute if you're kind of a, a geek and you want to check out um, what's happening with the development of ASP.NET Core. And I mean, just look at all the work items in here. Holy cow. Right. Uh, there's some really good stuff in here. So, so keep an eye out for that. It's all in the public eye now. Awesome. Um, just drop into the ASP.NET Core repo. And uh, again, jump over to Milestones. You'll see that stuff there. Uh, this is going to segue into a ton of stuff, John. <laughs> and this is this seems to be like the theme of the week for some sure. reason. Sure. Um, so this is a post by Richard Landers, something that you added to the queue here. Securing your .NET Cloud apps with rootless Linux containers. What's this yeah, about, it, John? You know, I, I shout out to Richard. Like, hi, Richard. How's it going, Richard? Canadian boy. Uh, I, I like Richard a lot. He's a he's a good guy. Uh, he wrote a, yet another article. He seems to just write, crank out these articles, which is awesome. But um, basically, he's talking about how all of the Linux container images that uh, that Microsoft provides relative to .NET um, is going to be including a, a non-root user. This is good for least privilege principles. And so you'll be able to host your .NET containers as a non-root user, um, as, as Richard says, with line, one line of code, which uh, always is a fun statement to make. So... Um, basically, this will make your .NET apps uh, more secure and um, talking about .NET being one of the most secure developer ecosystems. And uh, so this is all about defense in depth, uh, least privilege principles, et cetera. And so uh, Richard goes on to talk about how this change was inspired by our earlier project enabling .NET in Ubuntu chiseled containers. Um, and there's a link there. Basically, it's a distro list image that are uh, intended to be an appliance-like, so non-root um, and so that's a, a nice change there. And uh, what it does mean is that as, as you run these things, um, it goes down further in the article to talk about um, how this, this impact will start in .NET 8 and mm -hmm. that uh, all their Linux images will contain an app user. So that's the app that will be running your application inside the container. And you will not be able to delete or change any files that come with the container image unless you explicitly allow that. And so it talks about these changes, um, especially in the context of running this with uh, Docker. And if you're utilizing this um, as, a, as a Docker container, for example, in the context of a Docker runtime, basically, um, there's examples that show how that, that has an impact. Um, and then there's a, a switch to port 8080 um, is, is basically another um standardization that they've gone through so standardizing on port 8080 for all container images going forward and that's based on an early exper experience they've had with chiseled images uh which already listen on that port so, so a bunch of changes coming along the along with this so I'm doing the show notes and I'm looking through all of this and at the same time I get an alert that a uh, new video has dropped from uh one of the uh, most interesting engineers over at Microsoft that I like to follow, yeah. Steve Sanderson. Yeah. And he's got on his own uh, YouTube channel something he calls .NET Isolator, which reminds me a lot of the thing that we were just looking at. But the context is a bit different here it where yes. you were running Wasm. a um, – you were running a, a Docker container with Linux before. This is kind of, uh, I'm going to say container for lack of a better term. Mm -hmm. um, it's containerizing uh, the application with .NET itself. So .NET um, is hosting a WebAssembly application, which is sandboxed, which is then hosting a .NET application. So it's like .NET inception here. And everything inside of the WebAssembly.NET app is sandboxed from the host.NET app. Now, I have, so, not seen this, I have not seen this video. However, one interesting, there's a one right off that graphic, the thing that jumps out at me is, look how that, that WASM container is drawn. Basically, there's a little indent in there. Remember, we, we talked about this months ago of how, how everyone was looking at WASM as a technology for front end. And I, mm -hmm. I, made, a, I made the strong case that I think WASM is a strong, uh, has a strong case for plugins and plugin hosting and plugin development. And so I suspect, I have not seen this video, but I suspect that might be something that uh, Steve's talking about in this video where using WASM as a, as a basically a plugin uh, host uh, provides uh, a good and safe and sane container for hosting plugins. But I could be wrong. 
Yeah, he did mention plugins in here, uh, but he is talking about uh, hosting you know, one or many .NET apps running inside this isolated container. Uh, so it has like no no way of uh, being kind of you know hacked by the outside world. It has no communication in or out of that container. Uh, but it is it's very interesting. And uh, currently, uh, he's got some demos in here of how to do all of it. But uh, let's see if I could scan and find it um it is there it is it is up on github and it's available as a nuget package it's currently experimental uh but give that a look uh go over to his youtube page and you'll you'll find the video there you can watch it uh, in uh completion there um and I'll, I'll have this up on our um our links in the uh what do you call it? The the newsletter Show that up. I've been putting out on LinkedIn. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. on LinkedIn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, it's still interesting, um, you know, in the context of security and isolating it's apps huge. and all of that. I mean, like, 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 let's just think about this for a second. For the longest time, people have like anyone building a platform of any salt, it basically is going to provide a plug-in architecture because it makes sense to do so. The challenge there is how do you secure that thing? If you're allowing arbitrary code that hasn't been that hasn't been vouched or or verified, mm -hmm. uh, you, it's a real it's a real nebulous problem now because you're like, well, what does this code do? What you know, what are what are the expectations around it? How is it how can I secure this thing? And if you provide a, a containerized essentially runtime within your own app via Wasm, you can now isolate that that run and then just have it talk via message passing. So I think this is fantastic and it's really gonna help uh, with a, it's gonna help architecturally speaking for folks wanting to provide this facility within their own apps. And if I circle back to a minute to that uh, .NET 8 preview GitHub page, um, you could see some of the work being done that led to that discovery for um, for his video. Uh, they're, they're the process of removing, or not removing, but decoupling WebAssembly right. from uh, Blazor. Uh, so those two things are separate libraries and they don't, you know, you can run the WebAssembly stuff without taking any dependencies on Blazor. And you could see that in that .NET 8 uh, preview um, history in there. So that's pretty neat. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, you, you want to isolate things in your app and protect them. You know, you wouldn't want to, say, share some uh, some chat titles of your very high-tech uh, AI interface like chat GPT. I don't know if you noticed chat GPT was down all Monday. Okay. And um, my, my little quip about that was uh, on, uh, on my Mastodon feed. I said, uh, okay, who pointed chat GPT's training model at um, Garfield comics? It's like, got a case of the Mondays dad jokes. No, everyone's like someone, someone's putting their hands on their hips right now. Like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it, I thought, I thought uh, chat beat GPT took Monday off because Mondays, but apparently there was a um, security reason. So if you've ever used chat GPT, there's like a sidebar that has like all of your past chats in it. And the titles of those chats are auto generated from the context of what you um, prompted chat GPT with. So if you put like, uh, how do I uh, migrate a .NET app to .NET Core? It, it will like come up with a little title of .NET migration or something like that. Apparently these were getting um, mixed between users somehow. So it was exposing chat titles between other users that didn't create them. Oh no. Uh, so yeah, so they, they took the whole service down for a bit and then it came back up and the chat history was gone and it had like a little disclaimer in there is like, yeah, we broke this, we're working on a fix. Um, so yeah, that, that was an oopsie. So if you, if you noticed that was offline for an entire day, that was why. Uh, so I thought I'd bring that up in the context of security. Yeah. And uh, let's see here. What what was going on oh, in... Oh, God. Uh, oh, my God. This was awesome. Acropolis. <laughs> yeah. Acropolis. Uh, this is a really, really serious... Uh, well, I guess it depends on your context. But uh, so I stumbled across this on Twitter. 
And basically what this is, is a way that the Google, well, this has been reported online. So mm -hmm. the, according to this gentleman's tweet, and I'm not saying that this is true, I haven't validated this, but apparently what happens here is when you take a screenshot and you edit it using uh, a device, whatever, um, mm -hmm. it doesn't throw away parts of the image that you've cropped. So what that means is yeah, it keeps it in metadata shot, somewhere. Well, here's the thing. If, if you've, if you've, so it's not only cropped, but also not only cropped images, but also things that you've, you've, you've done to mask the image. Like say, for example, you'd use a Gaussian blur or in this image here, like a discord. Yeah, this is a really hey, good one. Card, right. So look at the downloaded image. Fair enough. But you can recover apparently due to this flaw, you can recover the entire image that was originally taken and modified based on this and it's not just um it's not just the i think that if you read the thread there's a bunch of other things that have occurred as a result of this but it has to do with the way that an api is used for mm -hmm. basically persisting uh the the image back um when it's been modified it doesn't draw the uh recovered Im it doesn't draw sorry the the image correct sorry i gotta get my terms right the api that's used more coffee to john Yes, I know. The API that's used to basically <laughs> save the modified image, um, it does. It does on on the surface. It looks like yes, it's fine. Like it's 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 uh, it's a it's a smaller image. It's been modified, etc. But the the data still exists within the file itself. It doesn't. It doesn't. Uh, that unedited data still remains, and so you can mm -hmm. recover it as a result. And so. This is not a good thing <laughs> because no. I, I don't know about you, but I've shared images like like similar to this where I've basically masked out things. Um, and uh, so it is it is something to be aware of. Now, when I looked at this, I was like, yeah, this is not good. I saw another example of this um, where uh, I believe that there I, I believe that there are other tools that may be susceptible to this um, possibility. So. It is something that um, you know people. I think I think I think folks need to know about. So this is something I saw creep up on on Twitter, and I just thought I would just say, "Hey, I saw this," and uh, just be aware. Yeah. yeah, this goes in the same bucket of like if you delete something off your hard drive, it's not really gone. Like mm -hmm. you can recover that yeah, data. You have to zero it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's in that same like realm of of stuff, but this is a little bit more. Um, uh, uh, like you said a couple weeks ago, I'll use your analogy, a foot gun. <laughs> like, mm, this is a little yes. bit easier to shoot yourself in the foot with because social media and sharing images is so easy these days. And all this stuff's built into your phone and you're just like, you know, you mark it up, you swipe, you know, uh, whatever direction on your device that is to yeah. share and it's off on your social media. Then somebody's got your credit card info or some part of an image you blurred out that you really didn't want them to see. Yeah. So, yeah, that's. Yeah, you can see this guy. This is on Twitter. So I can't, I, I, I don't know who this person is. I, I just saw this and I was like, oh, that's, that's not good. <laughs> so, yeah, I'd say yeah. that easily has merit. Um, also, there, there was a, um, some kind of security flaw that I don't have a link for, but I'll just mention it. While we're in here talking about uh, that, because it said Pixel phones were one of the affected devices. Pixel phones also they they sent out a security bulletin recommending that people turn off their Wi-Fi calling because of some security exploit that can break your phone. So make sure you turn turn that off until you can uh, see if there's a patch or something if you're using Wi-Fi calling. So uh, kind of in the same. Uh, realm for things again uh docker plus wasm technical yes. previews so this is like more containerization more web assembly uh more isolating your app using containers yeah so this is uh they, they this this is a post from the folks over at docker and they recently announced that they had a technical preview of basically it was a special build that they had that allows you to run your wasm containers with docker using a wasm edge runtime and so this is something that uh, they're uh, providing a technical preview now for, the technical preview two. And so they've been working on this and they've got um, basically an ability to do this. So um, it's it's a term called run WASI, is a, uh, as, as the term says, a multi uh, 
uh, company effort to make a library in Rust that makes it easier to write container D shims for WASM workloads. And so this is useful for folks who basically are on the, the WASM band, bandwagon and want to... The WASM wagon. I like that. Yeah, the WASM wagon. <laughs> That's right. So, um, and they show an example later on in the post talking about how to take it for a spin, uh, utilizing the CLI for Docker. And um, you can download the, the basically download the image, uh, which contains your application uh, hosted within WASM, and then um, basically show the, the result set of that. And they show it also uh, utilizing um, a WASM workload within uh, Kubernetes. Um, so there's a facility in Docker called Kind, which is, stands for Kubernetes in Docker. And um, it, you can basically run, um, you know, that if you want to uh, run your WASM workloads within that context. So it's very much peanut butter and chocolate all mm -hmm. getting mixed up nicely together. So um, I thought this was interesting. So I did a, I did a conference session ages ago called uh, the WASMverse, talking about all the different <laughs> WASM things that you could do with WASM at the time. I, I, I wonder if I should update that to WASM Wagon. I like... Wasm I like wagon. that one. I like that. Yeah, yeah. Getting on the wasm wagon. I, th <laughs> I, I will give you credit for every time I use it. I'm going to make you a rich man, John Bristow. Okay, sure. Yeah. Uh, introducing Grafana Cloud K6 United Performance Testing Observability. None of those words meant anything to me, John. What? What is this? Well, they mean? are all English. Come on. So. Uh, Grafana, I'm, I'm a fan of Grafana. I like what they do. They're a great observability tool, and uh, they basically provide a facility for um, doing great, great things around uh, observability. And they've recently talked about a K6 uh, cloud platform. This is a SaaS platform, basically, that they provide, um, which is uh, providing uh, the ability to do cross-functional load and performance testing. So I think it was two weeks ago, we talked a little bit about how Azure has this facility um, now where you can do load testing within its platform. And so this is a similar where for developers, QA, et cetera, uh, looking to uh, test out application performance, this is something that will give you uh, that facility. And so it is um, basically, um, K6 is, is part of an acquisition that they did um, and uh, basically allows you to um, get a, get traceability into how these things run. There's a video there that uh, kind of highlights how these things look when executing those tests, and um, so you can get a sense of what those those load tests look like. And so, um, if you're looking to do load and performance testing, and you're looking to capture that, um, you can see those running within this platform, and it gives you all the nice charts and pretty things that go along with that. So. Things like, you know, number of requests made, number of HTTP errors that occurred, um, latency, things like that. So um, just another thing to add to the toolbox of things that you can use. And so K6 is fully integrated into cloud for Grafana Cloud. And so you can visualize these tests running within your dashboards, which is awesome. And uh, if you're looking for a tool that um, amongst all the other tools that are out there, it seems like it's like everyone's doing these sorts of things. Um, mm -hmm. You can now check that out. It's a, a nice video, but I, I have to, I have to uh, knock a couple points off for the this, use this of. Is my, this is me Ed. every time I look at my results. I'm like the stock, <laughs> stock video here. I know. Like, you I gotta know. love the. Yep. What are you <laughs> I have no idea. I mean, if you're if you're gonna produce something like this, I mean, you you gotta do it. You gotta do it like um, like one of those as seen on TV commercials, John. Sick of all that messing and fussing just to share your Blazor demos? Well, fuss no more. Introducing Telerik Rebel for Blazor. With I won't make you suffer through that again. Wow. <laughs> I love I love the. Where did you get those uh, three and a half floppy disks? Where'd you get oh, those? Oh, so those are uh, those are not currently on my desk. They are actually coasters. <laughs> They're not, oh, okay. real. They're not real. They're not yeah. real. No, they're they're coasters that I had had on my desk. Where did they? You go? know what would have been awesome is if you had pulled out like some eight tracks. Yeah. You, know, you can't hold that many in your hand though. So hey, see, nice. I like if, it. I, if watch, so oh, there's geez. silicone silicone <laughs> co they're cup coasters, so I don't no put liar, coffee stains no on, on my desk. So they they improvise for the video. I'm sitting there looking at it and I'm like. Those those do need to go in the video. Those have to be because yeah, yeah. every every one of those videos that you ever see, those made for TV videos, there's like somebody frustrated and fumbling with the most 
mundane thing that doesn't really have a problem to begin with. Yep. And like, I remember one very vividly of like somebody that couldn't make pasta. It's like, there was this weird container, like you put boiling water and noodles in because you're too inept to boil pasta. And like, there's this person like throwing pasta all over themselves at the beginning of this video. I'm like, Oh my God. Uh, anyway, uh, a curl celebrating 25 years, John. Yeah. We talked about this last month. Uh, curl has, has just turned 25. Uh, so happy birthday to curl. Great tool used in, I don't know. It, I would be hazard guess it would be like trillions of devices now, certainly billions. Um, but they've really, they bumped basically their rev to V8, which, uh, basically is, is part, part and to celebrate, um, their, their birthday, obviously. Um, but, um, yeah, this is, this is a thankless job maintaining this library. <laughs> this is used yeah. everywhere. And, um, basically there's nothing major that goes into this release. They just decided to basically bump the, the major version, um, to have a little bit of fun on the 25th birthday. So, uh, nothing's breaking. Uh, it's just, you know, Hey, we're 25, you know, we deserve a, a, a major version bump because it's been on version seven for a long time, but, um, yeah. Just, uh, just you know, kudos to them for sticking to it and making such a fantastic utility. I've used this my whole technical career, uh, which actually exceeds 25 years now that I think about it. That's rather depressing. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I've, I've used this library immensely. And uh, shout out to those folks. I think um, they've done a fantastic job of providing something that just, you know, helps everyone. You say that like, you know, like we're old timers or something, but I totally dated us at the beginning of the show when I refer referred to you as Max Headroom. If that, that's right. If the 25 years of you using Curl didn't sell it, I mean, the Max Headroom I comment joke, surely I did. On, I made the joke on Twitter <laughs> yesterday. I said that uh, every, every, well, something to the effect of every time I get into a company, internal company Slack debate about music, I feel like the metaphorical red hand crystal from Logan Run lighting up. Um, on my hand because uh, I feel so old and I'm like, yeah, this is, this is what's going to happen. My, my crystal is going to turn red and it's going to be bye-bye for Johnny. So <laughs> uh, it, there's a dinosaur here. Just good, good segue. Um, yeah. It doesn't matter what, <laughs> what, what the conversation is going to, yeah. uh, why we added package.json support to Deno or is it yeah. Dino? Deno? Deno. Deno. Yeah. So, Ryan Dahl, who's the uh, original creator of Node, he's he's obviously working on Deno and the creator of Deno. And um, basically, one of, this was a major update that came out, uh, I think it was last month, where they they announced that they're adding package.json support to Deno. So Deno is a very secure runtime for for your JavaScript apps. And one of the one of the long standing sort of feature requests that people wanted was, hey, it would be nice for me to list my dependencies in sort of a package.json file akin to what I do with npm. And, um, you know, being able to have those listed and then just ha allow me to have the same facilities there. And so there was a, a there was a long time. It, I guess it was debated within the community. Like, should we add this? Is this like, is this a good thing, et cetera? And so Ryan wrote a blog post recently about the reasons that go behind why they decided to add package.json support to Deno. So, um, and so Ryan talks a little bit about making sure that it's, it's a good developer experience, which really is the main reason why package.json uh, support is there is to facilitate this sort of npm installed like experience. So package.json contains all kinds of things like your dependencies. It it, it it is it is a bit of a mixed bag because you can put so much in there. You can put like all your metadata associated with your package, all of your um, your your scripts. Uh, so you know, clean install, run, uh, dev, whatever. Like all your packages go in there. And if you mm -hmm. ever npm spec or behind package.json it's pretty big like there's a lot of stuff that you can put in there and so it is it is one of those things it also obviously is is aside from the developer experience is there to help with dependencies but that's part of it that's part of the challenge there is that it's not i think one of the reasons one of the reasons why npm and and uh, javascript gets such a bad rap is that the dependency management system is I don't think is as good as it could be, obviously, because when you go npm install, you get like it seems like the world of the internet coming down the the wire. And so, Ryan goes into the into the explanation as to why this was done. And I think it I think it was a good trade off. I think that they did it for the right reasons, which is developer mm -hmm. productivity, product um, sorry, package management and dependency management. 
I mean, if it's a JavaScript tool, a lot of people are very familiar with package.json already and NPM yeah. tooling and all of that. So it seems like a, a, an obvious fit from my perspective. I'm not sure why it was uh, such a hard decision, but I'm sure well, there's let's a lot of trade-offs that, there. Yeah, let's not forget that .NET went down this route at one point, right? And then they backed away from it. And yeah, so, but dot, .NET's not a JavaScript ecosystem. No, I know, I know, but... It was the same. It's just, you can think of it as almost the same approach, right? They went down this route, and they were thinking to themselves, "I, I don't know the whole story, but I would imagine they had this this, hey, we'll do package.json support because it will make it make it easier for JavaScript developers to come over to .NET, and it will be awesome." And I would imagine that would be my thinking. But then when yeah. you get into the weeds, you're like, well, "This is not going to work really well. Like it, it's yeah. a different animal." So, not to mention, new gets better. But anyway. Uh... <laughs> Over to uh, some uh, latency numbers every programmer should know. Yeah, this is some infographics, kind of. It's a, it's an old it's an old gist. Um, so this has been around for a long time, but I remember seeing this for, for the first time. So what this talks about is there's a lot of operations you'll, as a result of your code, will occur based on decisions you make in your code. So there's downstream effects that occur based on the decisions you make relative to the APIs you call. So if you're going to utilize a mutex or you're going to utilize a read or you're going to utilize something that has downstream effects. So what this does is it basically describes what those latency numbers mean in context. So milliseconds, nanoseconds, most developers would just shrug their shoulders and say, hey, who cares? But if you scroll down, here's the thing. If you put this in a relative context, so if you say that an L1 cache reference is going to take 0.5 seconds and you represent that as a heartbeat, so if we if we level set, we say an L1 cache reference is like a heartbeat. If you take a look at how long these other things take, you get a really good sense of how these all blow out in terms of relative relative to that measure. Um, a, a disk seek, for example, will be 16.5 weeks if you use a reference uh, measure of an L1 cache being a heartbeat. So you get right. to see what these impacts are relative to their relative to their duration if you set the L1 cache is one. I, I have to point out here, whoever wrote this is an, is a, 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 an espresso aficionado because <laughs> only somebody that likes espresso knows that it's 25, 25 seconds, seconds That's right. to make, make a coffee because like any other type of coffee no usually milk. takes like three minutes. Yes. Uh, espresso is the only coffee that you tr truly make in 25 seconds. That's that's like after it's been ground, tamped, locked and loaded and you yeah, hit the uh the shot. So uh 25 seconds making coffee. I I yeah, see you. you scroll down, this is I this see you <laughs> espresso fan. I know. Look look how long it takes to send a packet relative to an L1 cash hit. So to, to send a packet from from California to the Netherlands and back relative to that measure is 4.8 years. Whoa. So so here's here's my point. A lot of a lot of people a lot of people get hung up on this idea of hey, it's going to be slow relative to, you know, mm -hmm. if, if we do it this way it's going to be slow. It's going to take more milliseconds. I'm like, okay, fair enough, but you're also hitting the network like the network is orders of magnitude greater hit in terms of performance than say doing this operation relative to the local disk which is sitting right next to your program so have some context there anytime you hit the network it's like all right let's wait it's like waiting for youtube uh premium to come to australia see we've come full circle you know <laughs> yeah so it's fun i actually like is a little bit off topic but i had this conversation we'll say um it, it's kind of a debate with my daughter's teacher when she was in high school and uh, i got this call from a, a teacher and she said hey, i just wanted to tell you that you're i gave your daughter a uh, a pass hallway pass today and she took a long time and i was like how long did she take and she's like a long time and i was like well was it minutes? Was it like, like how long is a long, like t this is a relative feeling. This is like a gut feeling. Like you're telling me like she was gone a long time. And, and the reason that actually like stuck in my head is I used to do a lot of like UX work. And it was like, you talk to somebody about like, how does, how does the app feel? And they're like, well, it took a long time to do this task. 
And you're like, well, what, what's a long time? Did it take minutes? Did it take, you know, four seconds? What's a long right. time? You know, one long time to one person is not a long time. You know, it's very relative to the other person. So it's funny. I had this discussion with this teacher and they're like, you know, I'm not actually sure how long she's actually gone. I was like, next time you call, let, let's have like a definite time frame of why my daughter's in trouble rather than my gut feeling is she was gone too long. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, they, they never called me back about that, but anyway, um, move on to some AI stuff, John, uh, AI. So you say, uh Oh, this is actually something you're probably going to like quite a bit. Um, this is, uh, this is Mark Rober's, uh, YouTube channel. If you're not familiar with Mark Rober, uh, he's a pretty well-known YouTube, uh, guy for doing those, um, what are they called? The porch pirate videos where he glitter bombs porch pirates. Yes. Uh, yes. So Mark Rober used to be an engineer over at NASA. Um, don't know why he left. I don't know what he's doing these days. Uh, but I think he's, um, I think he actually has his own, um, company now. Uh, it's probably linked here where he's selling like these, uh, learning tools for people to, you know, young kids and, and people to learn engineering. But anyway, Besides the point, uh, he posted a really nice video and he says at the beginning, like, this isn't like a sponsorship thing. It's just something I, I found as an engineer to be really awesome. Um, and it's about a company called Zipline. Uh, it's a fascinating video. Uh, I highly suggest going there and, and checking it out. But the idea of it is drone delivery. And uh, he talks about, you know, Amazon was looking at drone delivery and it seems to be like pretty impractical. You've got these, you know, four propeller drones that are going to come buzzing in uh, over your head, dropping packages in your yard, that sort of thing. It's it's not very practical. Uh, so he uh, highlights this company called Zipline that is in Africa and they have kind of perfected this drone delivery system. Um, and the idea behind what they're doing is to deliver uh, necessary medical supplies to hospitals that are very right. far away. Okay. And we do this um, in Australia, we do this in Australia. We have, we have, yeah, we have uh, doctors who basically fly out to remote communities and, and, and provide medical service. Okay. The, those are doctors though. Like this is drones delivering yes, it. Yeah. just yeah. the supplies and um it, it's pretty fascinating how this this whole system works uh it, so they're able to within nine minutes package a supply drop it in a drone and ship it um and they arrive in a very short period of time but this thing can fly up to 150 miles round trip on a single battery charge um, and they're, they're constantly just launching these things in the video. It's just fascinating. It's, it's all hell to watch. And, uh, you know, they, they package them up. It flies to the hospital. Um, it launches via slingshot to get it to full, immediately to full speed. So it goes like zero to 60 miles an hour in an instant. This thing is up and flying. Um, in the video, he takes a car ride uh, to try to see how, you know, close you know, or how long it takes through like a car. It was like a four hour drive this thing was there in minutes um and they've actually cut like infant mortality by like 88 percent in the, in that region uh just because it's able to deliver these supplies to hospitals where they really need them what's nice about his videos he's an engineer so he he talks to the actual guy that created it and all the like prototyping they did um uh, his history, his childhood and stuff that kind of led him to this moment. So it's a really great video, uh, really inspiring and also just really neat from a technical perspective because these drones are using AI um, to, you know, navigate uh, AI and GPS to navigate to where they need to go and to target things and drop packages where they need to be. Um, and then there is kind of a uh, parent company here in the U.S. now that's looking at doing um, larger We'll skip the commercial there, but they're they're doing um, uh, larger, more widespread uh, delivery of commercial stuff. So you may see them um, get contracted out by you know, your Amazons and Walmart and stuff to do delivery of just regular goods uh, in the U.S. someday. You were right when you said I would like that video. I did. Thank you. Yeah, I will watch that. 
Yes, yeah, very, very good. Very well done. Um, uh, yeah, big fan of all the stuff that he produces there at, on Mark Rober's channel. Uh, you know, some of it's silly with the porch pirates and whatever, but he does a lot of uh, really cool um, stuff with uh, like feel good pieces. You know, he's talking about healthcare here. He's got some where they uh, kind of troll the uh, what do you call it um, scam artists that that call you and tell you you're. You know your your software's been hacked or whatever, and they actually like shut down a massive call center uh, that was harassing a bunch of old people and scamming them out of money. So he's done a lot of good work uh, over on that channel. Speaking of AI, John, GitHub Copilot ten is this ten? X. Yeah, it is X. Okay, I never no, never know it's when it's going to be X or ten. Uh, the AI powered developer experience. Yeah, so this is uh, something that was announced yesterday by GitHub. This is uh, available as, a, I guess, a preview, or they're just talking about this. And basically, it is evolving what GitHub has provided through uh, its AI integration for the past year and a half, I would imagine it is, mm -hmm. maybe two years. Uh, Copilot's been around for about a year, I think. And so uh, with GitHub Copilot X, uh, they're providing context. This is sort of like a vision model, I think, for, for GitHub of where they see Copilot helping. So they talk about it more than just the code first experience. It's also talking about things like, you know, helping you describe issues, helping you uh, formulate PR requests, uh, sorry, PRs. Um, docs are going to be driven based off of this. It's basically trying to deeply integrate GitHub's integrations with Copilot deeper and deeper into the GitHub experience. And that goes from all the way from the left side, which is code, all the way to the right side, which is the obviously the SaaS product, which is GitHub. And mm -hmm. so they talk about pull requests, being able to uh, suggest descriptions, uh, help reviewers reason about the changes they've made. Um, they're looking to integrate it within a CLI. So um, Copilot will help getting getting the right command written for you um, with multi-step shell commands, um, for example. And so you can sign up and, and join uh, the co you can join, join Copilot. And then I think the, the preview itself, I can't remember if they've kicked this off or when it will be available. Um, it's currently a vision. That's right. Sorry. I'm just reading here. So it's a, it's mm -hmm. a vision of the future rather than available product offering from Copilot. So yeah. basically what, what, what's happening here is, GitHub is taking its its AI integration to the extreme and making it available across all aspects of software development, which I think is great. I think we need yeah. more tools, not less. And uh, I'm I'm encouraged by this. This is very much synonymous with those uh, Microsoft Office videos you saw of the future, you know, future Office development videos. But I think mm -hmm. this is far more real. I think this has a far more practical aspect to it. And um, I'll be looking forward to this. Yeah, this is really interesting. It's it's going to be using Open OpenAI's GPT-4 model. Uh, it looks like it's already a descendant of GPT-3. Um, I've been doing some analysis and work with uh, GPT-4 over the last couple days. Um, I'll have to tell you kind of off air what that is, uh, but it's pretty impressive. Um, a lot of people are like, oh, it's out for my job and all that. I, I don't feel that way myself. Uh, I think it's going to maybe accelerate people to do things faster. Um, I don't see it like jumping in and like taking over coding positions. Um, although it's pretty nifty at generating some pretty useful code. Uh, but you have to know how to ask it and prompt it for the right things. Um, I think that that's part of being a professional and an expert is knowing exactly uh, what to say and uh, what to talk about to, in regards to like these models and how they produce stuff. Yeah. So uh, githubnext.com is the website that lists the projects there. So Copilot for Docs, pull requests, et cetera. You can see there are wait lists there. GitHub Next, by the way, if you haven't seen this, this is a place where you can go to find out more about what the what sort of the latest projects that GitHub is working on? So this is where Copilot originated from. Um, a lot of these projects have been there for a while, but the ones that they've just added uh, are around Copilot X. And so you, you can see there's now um, Copilot for Docs and pull requests, for example, part of the Copilot X um, offering. 
And then this final article, John, is just one of complete fascination. I have no expertise in this field, so not a lot of commentary here from me, other than uh, this is really just kind of geeky neat. Um, first ever complete map of an insect brain. So it took 12 years for researchers to map um, a fruit fly brain. So like they have like the all of the neurological pathways uh, for a gnat's brain. Um, and the article goes on to say like this is something they could use to model like AI models in the future. So they can make things uh, think more like a, a realistic brain, which is kind of creepy. But uh, yeah, that doesn't either inspire you or give you nightmares. I'm not sure which one is the appropriate response. Maybe both. It's interesting. It's interesting. <laughs> this doesn't scare me at all. This is part of science. And stuff. Love the <laughs> nice <laughs> Chong. Nice Chong uh, segue yeah, there yeah. at the end. Okay. Um, yeah, but it's it's definitely very very cool. It's a, it's a technological breakthrough for one. Um, I, I think they have like. Uh, like some single-celled organism, like worm type of thing that they've mapped before. This is the most complex thing that I think they've mapped thus far. Um, yeah, so very, very cool. And it's going to lead to more like research into like the human brain and all of that stuff as well. So that's Excellent. that's all I've got for today, John. That's it for me, and uh, we'll see you soon.